The Rebel Capitalist Show. All right, guys, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome someone to the Rebel Capitalist Show that I have really looked forward to speaking with. Because as you guys know from watching my whiteboard videos and this show, I've really been trying to think through how the monetary system actually works with the Fed, reverse repo, the repo market, the commercial banking system, and all these balance sheets. How on earth do they interact? So I found this next gentleman on Twitter, and he goes, I don't know if you go by the handle, but your website is fedguy.com. Yeah. And, and and Joseph, welcome to the Rebel Capital Show. Can you start off by telling people what your background is? Sure, sure. Well, first of all, George, I'd like to thank you for inviting me. I'm a big fan of your show. I've subscribed a long time ago. I've watched many of your videos, and I learned an enormous amount from it. So I'm really excited to be here today to be able to contribute uh, what I can to it. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, my background. So I actually, so recently I was uh I traded on the open market desk, and one of the things that I would do was actually run the reverse repo operation. So, um, so can, now on the open market desk at the Fed? At the New York Fed, yeah. Okay. So, but before that, though, so I, one of the first things that I did out of college was that I decided that I wanted to have a job that paid a lot of money and was, you know, fancy. So, <laughs> I, so I actually, right out of college, I went to law school. Okay. And I, uh, I went to law school at, at Columbia, and then I graduated, and I got a job at a big firm. And it was really exactly what I thought it would be. You know, you make pretty good money at a young age and you have a nice office in Manhattan on the 50th floor. But there's only one problem, and that was you actually have to practice law. And <laughs> that's just not very fun. Practicing law is basically like writing term papers for the rest of your yeah. life. And yeah. I didn't really want to do that. So I graduated school at the time of the financial crisis. And one of the things that um, I noticed there was that, you know, there's all this happening in the world. Uh, what's the Fed doing? Watching the, watching the Dow gyrate hundreds of points every day. And that really got me into the markets. I really wanted to understand how they worked. I wanted to do something more macro. And so ultimately, t going back to school, working at a credit analyst for a while, and eventually I landed myself um, as a trader on the open markets desk. And what I do there is I basically study the financial system. So. Um, like you were mentioning, studying the plumbing, commercial banks, dealers, um, that was that was part of it. And the other part, of course, is just running the operations um, on the desk. So doing repo and reverse repo with the street. And one of the things though, and I think you, you've talked about this before, is that it's kind of an opaque place, the plumbing of the system. Yeah. And it's really hard to understand unless you're at the Fed. When you're at the Fed, you have access to enormous amounts of data, for example, when you talk about reserve balances or when you talk about uh, repo, for example, we see all of that. So we see who's doing what in the repo market. We see who has what in the reserve accounts. And we get to be able to talk to uh, basically all the major market participants. You can call up the primary dealers, you can call up the banks, you can call up the investment funds, you can call up the money funds, try to figure out just what's going on. It's kind of pretty much a behind the scenes look as to how the system works. And so when you're there for a few years, you really be able to be, develop a very strong understanding of, of what goes on. And so I realized that I had this understanding and there was a tremendous amount of interest in the market to um, to understand that. So I began a blog and I wrote a book basically trying to teach people about how the financial financial system works. What's the name of the book? Oh, it's called uh, Central Banking 101. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Now, and, and very, let's plug it. Where can people get it? Can they just get it on it's Amazon? It's on Amazon.com. Okay, so yeah. I take it you're still working at the Fed. No, I don't work at the Fed anymore. I left the Fed. Um, oh, you so did? That's, okay. So that's so, part of the, yeah, I just to make really sure that. Just to make sure everyone is on the same page, can you explain what the open market desk does? Sure. Like, what is their job? And So what so, were you doing daily? The open markets desk is the Fed's trading desk. It's the desk that conducts all of the Fed's uh, open market operations. So when they do quantitative easing, yes. you're, you're the guy doing it. Well, I don't do it. I, I do the repo side of it, but people okay. on my team do the, do the quantitative easing. So the open markets desk does basically two things. One is uh, market intelligence and the other is running the open market operations. Market intelligence has to do with just talking with people on the street, figuring out what's happening doing some data analysis as to using the Fed's own data and uh, just writing reports and submitting them to to people higher up at the Board of Governors. 
to keep them informed as to what's going on in the market. And the other part is just running the uh, operation. So, you know, QE, buying treasuries, buying MBS, doing FX swaps, doing repo stuff. Okay, fantastic. So I think now we're, we're kind of on the same page. So let's dive into kind of the complexity and that opaqueness as uh, you referred to it earlier. Uh, you know, one of the, the ways I found you was when we were tweeting back and forth and I, I forgot how I got off on the topic, but we I was talking about, or I was trying to think through how the dollars are working on the balance sheet of the uh, primary dealer banks and the, the commercial banks that are kind of under the Fed's umbrella. Because initially I was under the assumption that when they would settle, and I should really explain this to people, but when the banks would settle a transaction, that the assets were largely uh, transferred in the form of bank reserves. So just just to back up here so the people are following what I'm saying. So let's just say that uh, you've got an account with Wells Fargo and your buddy has an account with uh, Bank of America and you need to transfer him, you, know, you do a Zelle payment for $1,000. Well, those dollars that are your assets are liabilities of the commercial bank where, where you have an account. So if Wells Fargo transfers that $1,000 to Bank of America or, or vice versa, they're transferring them a $1,000 liability. Well, they can't just keep transferring them liability after liability after liability after liability or else the other bank is insolvent. So there has to be a corresponding asset transfer that goes along with the transfer of that liability. So what is that? It, it can be a bank reserve, and that's a, a dollar in the form of a, a Federal Reserve liability, just like the dollars that you have in your account are a liability of a commercial bank. So that's pretty much what I was trying to think through. And what kind of sparked my idea was the fact that there are a lot of these uh, credit unions and smaller banks, and then of course banks outside of the United States that do not have reserve accounts with the Fed. So if Wells Fargo is transferring that $1,000 liability to XYZ Credit Union, what is the corresponding asset if that bank doesn't have, or if that credit union doesn't have an account with the Fed to receive those bank reserves? So why don't we start uh, with that first and foremost, and then we'll kind of go from there. Sure. So George, you're exactly right. So when banks settle payments with each other, it's usually with reserves, so central bank money. So reserves are instantly liquid since you know, they both have accounts at the Fed, right? So the transfer is instant and it's final. And because it's a liability of the Fed, it's, it's risk free. So you and I, we hold bank deposits, right? We, we still have bank credit risk. So and, and is that credit. is that what typically done through Fedwire? Yes, that's exactly. That's Fedwire, it's done okay. Fedwire, right? Now, the question about smaller banks. Well, I think that you've touched upon a really interesting question is, is to what do people who don't have Fed accounts do? Now, right. just to give you a sense of this universe, if you are a domestic bank in the US, you almost always have a Fed account, even if you're a credit union. So people who domestically who don't have Fed accounts, they're like really, really tiny banks that you wouldn't have heard of. Mm, okay. um, what they do, though, they could have, uh, let's say, um, they would have a they could have an account at, let's say, a bigger bank, right? Just and, like a just like a non-bank entity would. Uh, well, they could they could hold reserves. So if, you, if they're not big enough to have their own Fed account, they can hold it through like a sub account within, let's say, a big bank like Wells Fargo. So that's also oh, like an do. intermediary bank. Yeah, kind of like that. It's kind of they're holding reserves in custody. The big bank holds reserves in custody for the smaller bank because the smaller okay, bank yeah. doesn't have enough resources to have their to have their own. But for the foreign banks, though, so foreign banks can have reserve accounts. And if you have like a, a big bank like a SoftGen or a BNP or anyone that you would any bank that you would have heard of, they definitely have a Fed account. And but can, does it have to be through a subsidiary? It has. Uh, it's usually no. It's usually not through a subsidiary. So it's usually they they have a branch office in New York, and right. it's part of the legal entity that's let's say head office in you know Frankfurt or Paris or whatever, and they would open a branch office in New York, and that New York uh, branch office would have a Fed account. So okay. the way the big banks, big foreign banks work, so they, they're kind of like on the same footing as domestic banks. But if you're like a smaller foreign bank, like a medium sized bank or a small foreign bank, and you also want to have say a dollar business. You would each you would probably just have a deposit account at a big US bank like Bank of New York Mellon. So in a sense that when you make a payment, you're basically sending them you make someone if you're a small foreign bank and you're making a payment 
uh, for one of your clients, you would be sending, let's say, liabilities of, let's say, a big thing like Bank of New York Mellon, and Bank of New York Mellon would then go and wire reserves to to whoever uh, the, the receiver is. So it's kind of like a fractional reserve banking system built upon a fractional reserve banking system. Instead of holding reserves as settlement, they will hold uh, bank deposits of a big U.S. bank. Yeah, so I, I, I'm i following you right there. Basically, I'm trying to figure out how to explain this without the use of a whiteboard. But basically what happens is those banks you're referring to, yeah. they have a bank account at uh, Wells Fargo, just like you yes, or I would. Exactly. And uh, they have liabilities on their balance sheet, maybe just like you or I would, but we're a non-bank entity. Exactly. So when we have to transfer those liabilities to a bank, then that bank can therefore take uh, the liabilities that were our assets in the form of uh, dollar denominated liabilities and send those to the bank. And then on the back end, then that reduces their liabilities. And then they have to send that major bank uh, assets in, the, in the, which case would or could be bank reserves. Right, right. Well, Two level system. Let's walk through how the actual balance sheets work because if you're a non-bank right. and you're buying a treasury from janet yellen you're going to use dollars that are a liability of let's just exactly. say wells wells fargo as an exactly. example so once you do that then wells fargo is going to decrease the amount in your account from a hundred dollars down to let's just say zero let's say you only have a hundred dollars in there right. so that decreases wells fargo's liabilities by the hundred dollars exactly. and then the treasury goes onto the asset side of your balance sheet mm -hmm. well there has to be a corresponding asset transaction so what happens is wells fargo takes the hundred dollars in bank reserves that they have in their reserve account and then that goes down into the tga exactly. and then what happens is the fed says okay George, you've got that $100 of, uh, worth of treasuries. We want to buy that from you. So you say, okay, Fed, I'll sell it to you. So then the treasuries go from the asset side of your balance sheet to the asset side of the Fed's balance sheet. Well, how do they pay for that? Well, they've got to pay for it with bank reserves. So they say, okay, where do you want the $100? And I say, I want it back in my Wells Fargo account. They say, no problem. So they go ahead and credit Wells Fargo's bank reserve account with an additional hundred dollars of reserves that's the assets but then there needs to be an offsetting liability so then the fed instructs wells fargo to increase the uh the amount in your account or your balance from zero back up to a hundred dollars and so now you're made whole you're, you're right back where you started from there's the same amount of commercial bank liabilities, there's the same amount of uh, assets for the commercial banking system in the form of bank reserves, but there's an additional $100 of bank reserves in the TGA. So now let's take it a step further and, and stop me if I'm getting any of this wrong. But then Janet Yellen will go ahead and write out, let's say, a stimmy check to George Gammon. Let's say I didn't get it, but let's just say she writes a stimmy check to George Gammon for $100. I get that stimmy check. I deposit it with Wells Fargo. That gives them an additional $100 liability. So they take my account balance from $100 now up to $200. Well, there needs to be an offsetting asset to correspond with the, li the increase in liability of the commercial banking system. So then those bank reserves go from the TGA into the reserve account for Wells Fargo. Now, all of a sudden, Wells Fargo has $200 in bank reserves, where they started with $100. And my account, a liability of the commercial banking system, or dollars that are circulating in the real economy, has gone from $100 to $200. Bam, M2 money supply increases. George, that was absolutely perfect. And that's exactly <laughs> what happens. And I want to be honest with you, most people in the Fed don't even understand that. So you walk through that perfectly. <laughs> That's exactly what happens. It's complicated. It's a whole chain of transactions, and uh, it's a uh, it, it's it's it is what happens. So um, my question then would be a question I had for Snyder, or, or maybe actually he brought it up in our conversation. And uh, it's it's prior to the GFC, there were only maybe forty uh, billion worth of bank reserves in the domestic uh, or in the system uh, period. So how were uh, all of these transactions being done with that few bank reserves? And then how did that work as far as, uh, you know, just on the surface, you think, okay, well, there's 10 trillion in deposits. Uh, 
And back then, uh, back in the good old days, we had a 10% reserve requirement with the major banks. Uh, the smaller banks actually did not have that. And most of the foreign banks did not have reserve requirements. But with the major banks in the United States, they did. So how did they operate and how did that uh, system function with only $40 billion in bank reserves compared to the, uh, what is it now, four plus trillion that we have? That's a great question. So it comes down to two aspects of the market back then. One, there was a very active Fed funds market, and the other was intraday, intraday uh, liquidity of the Fed would lend. So when it comes to the first part, so if a bank was short on reserves, they would just go out and borrow it. And that borrowing is called a Fed funds. It's an overnight unsecured loan for reserves. So going back to your question, let's say, let's say I made a payment to you and my bank, Wells Fargo, wanted to send a payment to your bank. If my bank did not have enough reserves, it would just go to the market and it would borrow it from someone. And there was a very deep and dynamic market back then. Uh, so they could easily just step in, borrow some reserves, they'd have it in their Fed account, and then they could make that payment. Um, in the case that they didn't, though, I mean, the Fed was would also be able to extend um, basically daylight overdraft. So basically, within the day, they'll give you, they'll lend you some money. So you, you have enough reserves to make the system move smoothly. But at the end of the day, though, uh, usually banks want to pay that back because the interest is pretty expensive if you go from daylight to overnight overdraft. So the Fed extends a lot of daylight overdraft credit to make it to make the system work, even though you only had, say, 40 billion reserves. So maybe that has to do with the. Um, well, that wouldn't be because I, I talked to Snyder about the collateral multiplier that is on uh, treasuries, probably mortgage-backed securities as well and repo, but that's probably a separate thing. It's almost like there was a bank reserve multiplier that would allow them or the system to function that had, again, 10 trillion in deposits. Just right off the top of your head, you'd say, okay, with a 10% reserve requirement, well, there's got to be at least a trillion dollars worth of bank reserves in the system if they're 10 trillion, just roughly, in deposits. But well, you're saying that because yeah, of those... Not, yeah, all, not all the deposits are reservable, so... They have there's there's actually a system where you, you figure out uh, well, well there's two ways you can look at this so some of the deposits have higher reserve requirements and some of them have lower and the other way you can think about this is the bank does different things to manage the liabilities so let's say you have a 10 percent uh, reserve requirement for this demoth deposit okay what if i go and i borrow it and make it let's say uh, a two-year cd right and then the reserve requirements go a lot lower so you can kind of change the liabilities of your bank to, to have, a, I guess, a lower reserve requirement. And if you it, if it was really a problem, of course, you could always book the deposits somewhere else, uh, say in the Caribbean, that, that helps as well. So there's a lot of things you can do with your, with your balance sheet. Yeah, okay, so that's what the banking system was doing uh, to, to manage the fact that, uh, I don't wanna say only, because 40 billion is still a huge number, but they were working with 40 billion. And those, I guess there was, the bottom line was there had to be a lot of velocity with yes, those 40 the, the billion in bank reserves. Is what you uh, wanted to look at. That's that's the basically the velocity of the bank reserves. And yeah, back then you would have hundreds of billions of in transactions a day. Today you probably have 60. So it's a very different system. And yeah, you can and, actually go on the Fed's website to look at the daylight overdraft credit then, and it was also hundreds of billions. So there's, there's a lot of, uh, structurally the market is very different today than it was back then. Hmm. Okay, that, that that that's interesting. I didn't know you could find that on the Fed's website. That yeah, that's I'll, that's I sent you a link cool. later. Yeah, that that would be awesome. So um, now let's talk about the what, what I always or what I have been referring to is kind of the ghost ledger, and um, we were discussing this via Twitter because I was trying to kind of process this prior to the GFC, and I I I, I always got in the habit of uh and this is probably a mistake that i made of really uh thinking that the cash equivalents on a, a commercial bank's balance sheet on the, on the asset side was really in the form of just green pieces of paper or bank reserves but i, I didn't realize to which to the extent which they're also uh, can be dollar assets, dollar denominated assets on a commercial bank's li uh, balance sheet that isn't necessarily a liability of the Fed, but could be a liability of another commercial bank. And that kind of goes back uh, to a certain extent to what we were saying earlier. And this is in, in my, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of people uh, talk about it as though bank A has an account with bank B, just like we would. But in my mind, it's just kind of this ledger system. 
uh, that just, you know, it's an electronic ledger. One bank says, hey, I owe you uh, this many dollars. So let me back up so everyone's on the same page here. So it, let's just say a bank wanted to settle without using bank reserves. What would the asset be? Well, okay, if bank A transfers that $1,000 liability to bank B, then they could also transfer them a, an asset in the form of an IOU. It's just IOU X amount of dollars. If I transfer you a $1,000 liability, I owe you $1,000. Uh, and it's just like an IOU that they would have for a normal deposit account with the individual in the, or non-bank entity in the real economy. And therefore, they just have this ledger system where they go back and forth and they can have you know thousands of transactions a day. But then at the end of the day, instead of all those billions of dollars going back and forth, they just say, OK, I transferred you this much. Uh, you transferred me this much, or uh, this many IOUs as, as assets, dollar denominated assets, your liabilities. Then, uh, OK, I owe you, you know, billions of dollars going back and forth at the end of the day. And then maybe one bank owes the other fifty thousand dollars or something. And that's how they go ahead and credit that other bank. But it's still an IOU or a liability of the commercial banking system. It's not a liability of the Fed. So can you first and foremost walk through how that process works? Because I'm sure I've completely confused everyone right there. And then explain uh, to what degree that system is used domestically currently. So I think when you talk about an interbank deposit, what you're what you're referring to is just like a Fed fund sold. So what happens? So I, I guess a bank could accept just a deposit as payment, but you know you, you don't really want that because then you're kind of taking bank credit risk, right? So what you really want for settlement is you want a central bank liability. You want a reserve. And to the extent that you can't get that, you go and you borrow it. And if you have back then when you had extra reserves, you would sell it, right? So selling it is kind of basically lending it to another bank. So it's like depositing reserves. Well, it's like an IOU to another bank, like you mentioned. So at the end of the day, you could kind of look at that as banks depositing uh, at each other, but it's not that and, much. And, it, that and I'm sorry, Joseph, just to insert real quick, the, the yeah. correct term that I was looking for there was and that you used on Twitter was corresponding bank arrangements. Yes. That that's what I'm referring to. That okay. to put it in to put it into your uh, language. Uh, that's what I was trying to describe, probably very poorly there. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I wouldn't focus too much on the corresponding banking section because it's so small. Like, okay. So if you have let's say four thousand five hundred banks in the system, you would have like the, the amount of banks that would use a correspondent bankman. They're they're so small that you like they if you add up their assets. You, be like a rounding error because so a correspondent banking is, is basically when one bank holds reserves in another bank because they're not big enough to have their own reserve account right so okay uh, that's just there are banks that do that but it's in it's just very small small section. okay th then but uh, is a component of that that overnight settlement or just end of the day settlement that i was referring to the, the correct terminology there is deferred net Set settlement. I'm just reading that uh, online here. So, okay. is is that does that go along with that corresponding bank arrangement? Therefore, a very small part of the overall market. I'm not familiar with the term. I'm, yeah, I don't know. It, it's just basically where where we were talking about the corresponding bank arrangements. They go. They could go back and forth with every single transaction, but instead, what they do is uh, they, there's this system, this uh, deferred net settlement. And uh, this might be something that's just outside of the United States. This might be something that's exclusive to UK. Um, but uh, they just tabulate, instead of all those transactions going oh, back, you're asking actually if settling. Are net or gross. Yeah, then at the end of the day, they you just net up all so the transactions. Gross. So there's just one uh, settlement instead of thousands going back and forth to make it more efficient. So there's, this is getting really into the weeds, but there's actually different settlement systems. You have gross net settlement systems, like you mentioned, it's called the CHIPS system, and right. that's usually right. for, for payments to, uh, let's say, internationally. But for domestically, most uh, payments are in Fedwire, and that's gross, so uh, there's no netting there. Okay. Oh, yeah. So that's gross, meaning it's it's per transaction instead yes, of that's just right. once you, at the you end. Know, it's day. not like I, you owe me ten and, and I owe you twenty, and we net that to to just ten. So no, it's it's ten there and twenty back. So 
Okay, perfect. So I, I'm starting to understand this better. So, and and even if uh, there was a lot of velocity and going back and forth prior to the GFC with the bank reserves, to you know, to your point on Twitter, now that there's four trillion in bank reserves, if banks want to settle, uh, they can easily do so without really having to borrow too much or. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're flushed with bank reserves. Now, that might not translate into lending and more dollars being created in the real economy, uh, but they're not struggling for reserves, that's for sure. No, uh, that's, is that that's correct? Right. That's right. And that's, you know, that's part of design as well. When you have a saving system that's flush with reserves, it's very difficult to have bank runs. If you only have, let's say, 40 billion in reserves and everyone starts withdrawing, you can easily get some stress in the banking system. When you have 4 trillion, uh, it's really hard to have stress, right? Everyone can withdraw their money and all the banks can make their make their payments because they have so many reserves. And okay. you can kind of, so if you look at a chart of daylight overdraft it, that the Fed offers its commercial banks, you can see that back in the uh, GF, before the GFC, it was quite high. And then when you had QE, it just got boosted to zero. Oh, right. because no, one needs right. to, no one needs to borrow from the Fed um, during the day anymore. They have, like you mentioned, tons of reserves to make payments. So the role that reserves play today, though, it's it's a bit different than during the GF before the GFC. Before the GFC, people held reserves just to make payments between banks. But now there's a there's a requirement called an HQLA requirement. So so during the GFC, there was a banking crisis, and afterwards the official sector got together and they put all sorts of regulations together to try to make the banking sector safer. And that set of regulations is called Basel III. And it included a whole host of things that made the banking system more resilient, like higher capital requirements, leverage ratio, and one of them is a liquidity requirement. And so banks are required to hold enormous amounts of liquidity. So today, reserves largely fulfill that purpose. They, they, there's a lot of them, and they kind of have to hold them because of the regulations. Mm -hmm. So how do, does Basel III or those regulations affect bank lending and it, because the reason I'm asking that is because in, in my mind I, I see the system kind of prior to 2020 as though the commercial banking system was really responsible for creating the majority of new dollars in the form of, of new loans uh, whether it's creating dollars or destroying dollars with loans being paid off that was really in the commercial banking system and even though the government may run let's say a trillion dollar deficit if uh, that those bonds or treasuries are being purchased by entities or non-bank entities uh, in the the real economy, then the dollars are coming out of the system, uh, called M2 or broad money. And then when the government spends the money back into the system, it's just rearranging the dollars. It's just redistributing. So on net balance, there's no more additional dollars in the system if if. Uh, the government is pulling the dollars out of the real economy before they go ahead and and spend it. But but now it seems like we've got this kind of hybrid system. If you look at M2, going back to 2020, you see that you know it just goes parabolic. Everyone knows that. And then you see the Fed's balance sheet, and then you look at the deficits going you know four or five trillion, we'll call it. And it seems like the Fed is basically monetizing that debt by creating new bank reserves to pay for those treasuries. Therefore, when Janet Yellen spends that, those dollars back into the real economy, it creates additional uh, liabilities of the commercial banking system uh, above and beyond what were there before because those dollars never got sucked out to begin with. It, 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 am I correct to, to see things that way? Or no, you're exactly something? right. And you know that, that is a hard concept that most people don't understand. We kind of have this two-tiered monetary system where you have reserves, which are money for banks, but bank deposits, which are money for us. So when the Fed does QE and massively creates uh, reserves and they go on to the asset side of the commercial banks, it's balanced by liability of bank deposits. So you're right. Essentially, what's happening is that the, uh, the Treasury is, is spending a whole bunch of money that is funded by the Fed. So the Fed is creating a whole bunch of money. But one, one, I think one wrinkle that I would, I would think about is that um, Treasuries are kind of a form of money in the financial system. If you really think about it, you know, like a hundred dollar bill, it's a hundred dollar bill. Uh, it's printed by the government, right? But a hundred dollars in treasuries is also printed by the government. It's basically money that pays interest. So if you keep that in mind, 
Another way you can think about this is that the Fed is kind of taking treasuries as money and converting them into bank deposits. And the difference being that bank deposits don't pay interest, but the treasuries do. And there's a credit risk asset aspect as well. So that kind of forces everyone who can't take credit risk or who wants uh, a little bit higher yield than 0% bank deposits to go into, let's say, buy corporate debt or buy equities. And, you know, that's kind of by design. Yeah, right. So that's where I, I, I reference this video that the Bank of England did all the time, but they talk about QE trying to lower rates in the real economy. So people go further out the risk curve, yeah. basically by, by stocks and, and equities to yeah. increase the it's quote unquote wealth effect. Wealth so effect. Yeah. yeah. But see, the thing that I go back to there is every time the Fed did QE, it, it interest rates actually went up. And so, and I've talked to Snyder about that. He assumed that that's because the market initially believes that we're going to get some significant uh, bouts of inflation due to the process of quantitative easing. Therefore, the long end of the curve actually uh, sells off, uh, meaning interest rates rise. Um, and, you know, we saw it just now in, in 2020, as soon as the Fed came out and kind of announced QE infinity back in uh, March of 2020, you know, that's when the curve really started to steepen. And it's just as of April with, uh, ironically enough, reverse repo, it kind of coincided with the 10 year starting to go back down from call it one seven, I don't know where it is today, one one point one five or something like that. So uh, can you explain that process from, from your view? How is it that when the Fed is trying or actually creating more demand at the long end of the curve by doing quantitative easing, are rates actually going up because, you know, I, I think we have to answer that question first and foremost before we can even get into things such as yield curve control. Well, when the Fed is buying treasuries, the intention is, as you say, to put down the pressure on yields. I'd say the Fed owns uh, $5 trillion in treasuries now, right? If you if you buy $80 billion a month of treasuries, you would expect that to have upward pressure on price, which, you know, down pressure on yields. So that's what it's trying to do. But, you know, the way that many things go into price other than just uh, supply and demand, right? The beliefs that the market has matter as well. And it does, in that case, I guess it does appear that the market thinks that maybe this is inflationary and so they, they will sell off on the long end. Um, so that 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 is a tricky thing because if your intention is to lower yields, then, you know, I mean, you want to buy more, but if buying more makes yields go higher, then that, that's counterproductive. Yeah, because and the reason I kind of transitioned that or dovetailed that into yield curve control is because a lot of people believe that, OK, we're going to get a significant bout of inflation, but the long end of the curve isn't going to go up because the Fed's just going to peg the yield curve, uh, kind of like they did in 1940. But every single time I or in the 1940s, I should say. Uh, but every time I hear that argument, although it sounds plausible, it sounds correct. You, you I think to myself, can they even do that? Because I understand every single time they try to lower rates, it does the exact opposite. Now, I know quant it's a little bit different because QE is a set fixed dollar amount where yield curve control would basically be unlimited uh, purchasing just uh, to make sure that the interest rate didn't go above a specific level. But it's kind of a, a head scratcher. So I think of yield curve control as just a more efficient way to conduct QE. Mm. So... QE is about well, the Fed wants to put down the pressure on yields, right? But you know, as you as you just alluded to, sometimes people see this and they sell off yields. But QE also has some side effects when it comes to the mechanics of the plumbing. You create a whole bunch of bank reserves and you know deposit liabilities. The banking system kind of gets stuck with all this stuff, and you know that kind of impacts their ability to function. So you have the reverse repo facility to help out with that. But you know, it, it, I think the Fed usually doesn't want to have a big balance sheet. So a way to lower yields without having a big balance sheet is to do yield curve control. And it's worked out in Australia and in Japan. And I feel confident that if the Fed wanted to do that, they could easily do that. No one is going to fight the Fed if the Fed says, OK, the 10 year from now on is going to be uh, you know, 1.2 percent. The Fed definitely has firepower to, to enforce that. Um, I, I can't see the market wanting to test the Fed on something like that. And you know, they, they wouldn't even have to buy anything. They would just say that and the yields would be pinned and you know, they wouldn't really have to. Like win. we saw a corporate junk debt in, in 2020. That was amazing, really. All the Fed did was buy $10 billion in corporate yeah. bonds. And it's a $10 trillion market, but all they <laughs> yeah. said it was that. Yeah. You know, everyone yeah. just got bonkers. 
Yeah, it it just it just kind of um, it just goes to show you that uh, the Fed's power, if they have any, is uh, probably more so psychological uh, than anything else. It's it's expectations policy, and um, you know that that's uh, I was listening to Snyder and Emil the other day on their podcast, and uh, they came up with a great concept. I think Emil was saying how. Uh, the Fed doesn't necessarily supply the market with "quote unquote" money, uh, but they supply the market with narrative. And I, I, if you think about that for a moment, it 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 makes a lot of sense. But you know what you're touching on there is kind of the collateral side of the issue. So if we're doing yield curve control, they're buying unlimited amounts of bonds, then that is taking collateral out of the system. And that leads us to to repo, and uh, so then the Fed sets up the reverse repo, uh, which would allow that collateral to a certain degree to get back into the system because it goes onto the Fed's balance sheet, and then if it is needed, let's say uh, a market participant can do a reverse repo at the Fed, then they get back that treasury that they just bought uh, that they could use as collateral. But when I was discussing this. Uh, again, with Snyder, he was talking about the collateral multiplier, and and maybe you can shed some light on this. But he was under the impression that if an an entity, a private sector entity, does a reverse repo with the Fed, that that uh, collateral, because it stays on the Fed's balance sheet, technically, they can't sell that. They can't do anything with that collateral. They have to hold it on their balance sheet until the maturity date of the specific repo transaction. Whereas if they did a term repo, let's say, with a counterparty in the private sector and private repo, then they could take that treasury, rehypothecate it several times, they could sell it, they could do whatever they want to with it. The only thing they would have to do is have some random treasury that they gave back to the entity at the maturity date of the repo transaction. It could be any treasury, it doesn't have to be the specific one they borrowed. Could, 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 do you have any insight to that? So. So when, when, when you people do repo, um, let's say reverse repo, basically, you're putting in cash and you're taking in treasury securities, collateral in this instance, right. you can do and take in MBS or other collateral, so but for the most part, uh, let's say it's treasuries. You, you do this for a couple of reasons. And, and, and the, sometimes if you're a money market fund, what you're really looking for, though, is just a safe place to park your money overnight. Right. right. And the collateral helps with that because that makes it safe. But it's not so much you want the treasury security itself is that you want to have a space place to deposit your money. So when the Fed has a reverse repo operation, it's kind of like having a safe depositing your money overnight at the Fed. You don't have credit risk. So that, that's a safe place to store your money. Sometimes people do reverse repo because they actually want a treasury. And they could maybe, for example, if you are a dealer and you sold a treasury, you got to go out and find it to deliver it to the person you sold right. it to. And in right. that case, you'd be reversing the treasury because you want that treasury collateral uh, to do to to complete your sale, so the motivation does matter. When you're looking at the uh, what's happening, let's say in the reverse repo operation or in the front end, the vast majority of that really has to do with cash having to uh, a safe place to park. Uh, so you have about 4.5 trillion dollars in money market fund assets, and uh, I mean they they don't want the, I mean they're not going to do anything to collateral. They get the collateral, but it just stays with them because right, you know, right. they just want it for security. I mean it's not their business model, their mandate to being able to, like, uh, you know, sell it or anything like that. They just want to have security. Um, this is super in the weeds, but there are different segments of the repo market. And when you, the way, one of the segments, the tri-party market, and the other is the bilateral market. The Fed conducts repo in the tri-party market, and all the collateral in the tri-party platform is stuck there, so you can't move it. So, uh, but if you do repo outside the tri-party platform, then you could go and do Let's say you can go and repledge it or sell it if you want. I see. I see. So, so those treasuries on the Fed's balance sheet that the uh, entities are are receiving through reverse repo, although the money market funds themselves, it's not part of their business model to do anything with them. They they couldn't do anything with them even if they wanted to because of the way it's structured, it's like that tri-party repo. It's stuck on the tri-party platform. I guess yeah. it's might be possible to like pledge it to someone else who's on that platform, but it's stuck on that platform. Okay, it, so so the, where I'm going with this, uh, just <laughs> like George, you're going off on some tangent. What's the point? Uh, the the point is, if they're 
buy if they're having to peg rates by buying that many treasuries from the market and they're going onto the Fed's balance sheet, they're taking collateral out of the system and collateral that could be used with a very high multiplier to create more dollars, to create more lending, and then potentially at the end of the day, uh, create inflation in the real economy. So uh, do, do, you, do you see a risk there that the, the, uh, by implementing yield curve control that they would uh, kind of screw up the system for lack of a better term by taking out that collateral that the system needs to function on all eight cylinders? Well, the Fed buys treasuries and takes collateral out, but new collateral keeps coming into the system. I mean, your de- the deficit is... The <laughs> the- <laughs> your drunk, <laughs> insolvent Uncle Sam is providing all this collateral. <laughs> so to say that, oh my God, there's not enough treasuries. Ah, oh, well, they can do something about that, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. Um, but, but you know, what if we got... Of, yeah, go ahead. Know, moving money through the... You know, tre- when you think about moving like hypothecation, hypothecation, a lot of it, I think of it as just kind of how fungible treasuries are with bank deposits. So uh, if I have a treasury, I can repo it out and I can get cash and whoever else is holding that can also repo it out and get cash. It's I, I don't think of it so much as of leverage as it makes treasuries much more fungible with, with other forms of money. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, treasuries are a form of money in the financial system. So I... Uh, I yeah, but what, but what's interesting about T bills, more specifically on the run T bills, right. is that uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of these primary dealer banks can uh, can get a lot bigger return by I don't want to call it financial engineering, but that that's but, but by using those treasuries to do other things with them. So let's just say that the T bill is throwing off a. Uh, three basis points or something like that. So they're they're saying, listen, I, I don't mind uh, paying that high of a price for uh, a T-bill because I'm going to take that T-bill and do X, Y, and Z with it, and I'm going to make 20 or 30 basis points. So this, this is why a, a primary dealer bank, as an example, may prefer to have a T-bill on their balance sheet as opposed to just a bank reserve. Because I think a lot of people get get stuck on that. They're like, "Well, okay, I, I get it, but why would any bank want a um, a T bill instead of a, a a bank reserve, especially if uh, the T bill is isn't paying anything? If it's at the zero lower bound, why not just hold the bank reserves? Why not just hold the cash? It doesn't make sense to a lot of people." Well, if you're talking about a bank, well, the bank gets interest on reserves, and that's 15 basis points, right? So it makes a lot of sense for them to hold reserves rather than T-bills. And historically, banks don't really hold T-bills. Now, the dealers, though, there's something different. A dealer is separate from a bank. It doesn't have a Fed account. So the dealer is in the business of basically buying and selling securities. So let's see, uh, if I wanted an Apple stock, for example, there's only you know one Apple stock I go to uh, exchange through my broker to get it. But if you want to buy a treasury, though, there, there's no exchange. Everything is, um, you know, it, it's between you and the dealer. So a dealer would go and they'd buy all these securities at auction and then they'd sell it to their clients and I'd have to buy it from a dealer. So that's that's kind of the business model. Uh, one of the main lines of businesses of a dealer is just to hold securities and sell them. So what the dealer would do is they would go and buy a uh, bill at auction, for let's say five basis points and then sell it to someone else for three basis points and they pocket that difference. So. I mean, they could do other things with their balance sheet, but you know, I, I think, uh, for example, they could do match with repo where they borrow, uh, let's say, borrow from money funds and lend to hedge funds. Um, mm. But you know, in terms of just bills, is something uh, something unique about bills that they they can do with that they cannot with other treasury collateral. Um, uh, you know, I'm I'm not aware of that. Okay. All right, so let, let's kind of move on, and I want to kind of dissect this uh, recent blog post that I would really encourage, well, I'd encourage everyone to go to your blog and, and read all the blog posts. It's, it's really fantastic, and again, it's fedguy.com, but uh, more specifically, this is a post you had on July 19th where we're talking about reverse repo uh, at the lower bound, and of course, the, the, the big news lately is that the reverse repo facility, uh, I don't know where it is uh, this week, but I know last week it got up to over a trillion dollars. Uh, 
in one day. So can you go ahead and if you remember uh, your, your blog post here, can you give us kind of the Reader's Digest version of the blog post and then we'll get into more of the specifics? Sure. So a lot of people look at the reverse repo and think that it's draining liquidity from the system. And what that blog post goes does is that, is that it breaks through on a let's say T account basis as to what actually happens. And so what happens is that the banks lose reserves, so it's draining liquidity from banks, but it actually doesn't drain liquidity from the non-banks. So right. you can think about it from let's say the bank's perspective and from the non-bank's perspective. So from a non-bank's perspective, suppose that I go and I, you know, I lend the Fed hundred dollars, right? So instead of having $100 at the bank, I have $100 at the Fed. So I still have $100 and the money comes back to me tomorrow because right. it's an overnight loan. But from the bank's perspective though, let's say it starts today with $100 in deposit liabilities to me and $100 in reserves at the Fed. When I go and I, and I uh, invest in a reverse repo, then the bank settles that payment for me. So the bank sends the Fed $100 in reserves and extinguishes the $100 in deposit liabilities. Right. So the bank, its balance sheet gets smaller and it, it loses liquidity. But for me, in the non-banking sector, the liquidity is just in a different form. Instead of having a deposit at a bank, I have a deposit at the Fed. So I think that was a confusion that I often heard on Twitter. So I just thought I would clarify that. Yeah, that's actually exactly kind of how I outlined it in a, in a whiteboard video. So I'm glad I, I hopefully got that one correct as far as those the bank reserves when they're leaving the way i see the feds the liability side of the feds balance sheet are three major kind of compartments you've, you've got the bank reserves then you've got the tga which is the treasury general account and that's basically the the treasury's uh checking account or bank account right. and then you've got the reverse repo account so right. uh, to your point when those hundred dollars uh of assets are, are transfer the bank reserves from, let's say, Wells Fargo. Uh, and let's say I have an account at Wells Fargo for $100. I'm just going to reiterate this so everyone's on the same page. And I say, you know what, Wells Fargo, I want to transfer my $100 to the Fed's reverse repo. I want my dollars as a liability of the Fed. I don't want my dollars as a liability of Wells Fargo. So they say, okay, no problem. We'll take your, uh, we'll take your balance of your checking account from $100 down to zero. Now you have a zero balance at Wells Fargo. Well, that decreases Wells Fargo's liabilities by $100. Okay, so, but then there needs to be a corresponding uh, asset. So that would be in the form of bank reserves that would, they would transfer from their reserve account at the Fed down into the reverse repo account. So now your dollars or my dollars are a liability of the Fed. They're not a liability of Wells Fargo anymore. And Wells Fargo has $100 less in bank reserves. So if they're using those bank reserves uh, to back up future loans, does the process of reverse repo, especially when it's 99.9% .9 money market funds, let's say, to your point, non-bank entities, does that decrease the lending capacity for those commercial banks? Or does it even matter because they're so flushed with reserves? Or does it even matter because even if they didn't have the reserves, they could just borrow them to create more loans? Yeah, so I think that's a really good point. And a lot of people look at the, all the reserves on the bank's balance sheet and also look at the constraints banks have. And they think maybe the bank doesn't have any space to make more loans because it's so full of reserves. So banks actually have a lot of control on their balance sheet. If they would, first of all, they would much rather have like a you know a loan that earns in 5% than a reserve that only earns in 0.15%, right? So if they wanted to shrink their balance sheet to make loans, then they could just kind of push people out of the bank and make them go to a money market fund. But with respect to the question is whether, you know, banks don't have enough reserves to make loans. No, banks have tons tons of reserves to make loans. Remember back back in before, uh, before the financial crisis, the banking sector only had 40 billion and now it has uh, 4 trillion. So it's it's never a reserve constraint. If, if it didn't have reserves, it can go and borrow it, not from another bank, it's the Fed funds market doesn't work anymore, but it could go borrow it from, uh, let's say, a federal home loan bank or some other person in the market. So that, that, that doesn't constrain banks. What really constrains banks is, I think, and what the Fed does is that it, find, it does a survey to banks asking, asking them whether or not 
uh, their lending standards have increased or whether or not loan demand is increasing. So after the great financial crisis, banks have a lot more regulations and it becomes a lot more expensive for them uh, to make loans. And into the real economy. Into the real economy, right. So they have all these regulations, it's much more expensive. You know, I'm going to back up a bit and I think I'll talk about just a little bit about bank lending and the capital markets because I think that kind of goes to your, to your question a bit. So when you want money, you can either borrow from a bank or you can borrow from the market. Now, usually what happens is that um, a smaller company can't borrow from the market because they don't have a credit rating and they don't have access to capital markets. And so they'll go and they'll borrow from a bank. And what happens is if you're a bigger company, then is that you go and you borrow up of the market. So because of QE and because of zero interest rate policies, you know, with 10 years at like 1.2, right? So a corporation can probably borrow in the capital markets, you know, like maybe one or 2% higher than that. So for a bank to be able to compete with the capital markets, it's very difficult. Um, the capital markets are much cheaper. So what you see is the big companies going and issuing record amounts of corporate debt because it's so much cheaper for them to borrow from the market in the world of zero interest rates and, and QE. So right. there's a lot of credit, uh, there's a lot of borrowing that's happening. It's just not through the banking sector, it's through the capital markets. It's the big bank, it's the big companies borrowing in the capital markets. Now, going back to the small companies, now they have to borrow from banks and they usually have to pay a higher rate, right? Compared to the capital markets. And so that part, if you just look at that, you'll see that loan growth hasn't been very I don't know, remarkable in the past uh, in the past year. It's, it's actually declined since PPP. It went, right. it, there's this moonshot with PPP, but then after PPP, if the, if the charts I'm looking at are correct, it, it's, it's really been on a decline. So, well, you know, PPP, PPP actually the total amount was 800 billion. So that's, you kind of gave everyone 800 billion. You'd imagine they probably don't need such money right away, right? <laughs> well, that's true. That's a good <laughs> and point. You, yeah. you know what, half of that gets forgiven and maybe the rest of it get forgiven as well. So that's a lot of free money. Um, so when you see that banks aren't making a lot of loans, is it that there's not a lot of demand or is it that the bank standards have tightened? And when you look at the Fed surveys, it's it's a little bit of both, but it's, it's coming back. So the banks just went through COVID, you know, they, they saw businesses were not doing well, so they raised their loan standards. Now it's coming back a little bit. And the small businesses, they got all this PPP money, they didn't really need to borrow. And so they uh, they didn't really need to borrow, but now they're, they're going back to normal. So if you look at the surveys, what it looks like is that, you know, like you said, there wasn't a lot of big loan demand, but it is improving. So I am I correct to assume that when these big corporations are borrowing from the the marketplace they're they're borrowing dollars that already exist or exactly. commercial bank liabilities that already exactly. exist and therefore there's no net increase to the in amount the of money. dollars in the right. real economy but when those when the smaller entities borrow from the actual banks then that whether it's even a, you or I, if we go and get a mortgage from a bank, uh, that five hundred thousand dollar mortgage that we're taking out to buy the house, those are dollars that did not exist exactly. before. So, so there, there's a big difference in lending there as well. That that's a meaningful difference. And going back to your point earlier, you know how the basically the treasury just spends money into existence when it's financed by the Fed. So basically, the treasury kind of. So if you look at the Treasury and the Fed together, they basically just kind of created a whole bunch of money that they spent, and that creates a lot of new money. So it's not just banks that can create new money, but the government can as well. Yeah, that's and, that hybrid system I've been talking yeah, about. Yeah, exactly, my exactly. Yep. So even though the commercial banks are not creating as much money as they used to, the, yeah, the, the official sector is creating tremendous amounts of money. And one of the crazy things, like, so as you know, bank deposits are what money are to you and I. And Banks file these regulatory filings to kind of break down how many bank deposits they have by account size. And they have a breakdown between, uh, let's say, accounts less than 250,000 and accounts more than 250,000. Uh, 250,000 basically is FDIC insurance limits. So you can kind of use that as a proxy for like a mom and pop or basically retail, right? Money that's in accounts that have less than 250,000 are retail. Uh, what happened over the past year is that that number has exploded, increased by, uh, let's say, $1.3 trillion. So over the past year, retail defined as people who have less than 250000 in their account 
they have 1.3 more trillion dollars more money in their account. So it's a it's an explosion that uh, what the government did. Even though the banks are trading, the uh, Uncle Sam is uh, working overtime. Yeah. So let me play devil's advocate here, sure. uh, because I I know a lot of my my good buddies on FinTwit will say, okay, George, but you're not explaining the whole process of quantitative easing because the Fed technically cannot buy those treasuries at auction directly from Janet Yellen. Uh, it, it's got to be through, I believe, the, the the primary dealer banks that have to buy the treasuries first, and then the Fed will buy those treasuries from the actual primary dealer banks. So it's and, and why that matters is because if the primary dealer banks, let's say they're not using bank reserves to buy those treasuries, then they're using some other form of cash that could be used for some other purpose. Therefore, the uh, or uh, let's say cash that is a liability of another commercial bank. And therefore, that cash is coming off their balance sheet to pay for the treasuries that that cash is now extinguished. It's it's, it's gone uh, because those treasuries are then going onto the balance sheet. And then effectively, once the Fed buys those treasuries, then they're replacing what was cash that could have been used in the real economy with bank reserves. Therefore, when the TGA spends the new money into existence, it is actually a net wash. It's not increasing the amount of dollars in the private sector because those dollars came off the primary dealer bank's balance sheet which were potentially liabilities of the commercial banking system in the first place. So the, 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 the big question that I always go back to in my mind is, can the primary de- or do the primary dealer banks actually use bank reserves to buy those treasuries from Janet Yellen? And therefore, the, the Fed is just replacing the bank reserves that were used when they buy the assets in the first place to the, the quantitative easing process. No, uh, Does that make sense? Probably, well, I'm going to have to reference the three-step video later. Uh, so yeah. primary dealers usually don't have reserve accounts, so they, they're going to pay with bank deposits. But I, you know, I would just I would just look at you know the, this intermediary sh- intermediary chain. It's it's really complicated, like you just mentioned. I would just look at what happens at the end of the day. At the end of the day, you look at the Fed's banking statistics, right? Reserves balances go higher, bank deposits go just uh, just as high so obviously there's new money in the system right okay okay obviously. yeah in, in, not in, just in, yeah i mean like trillions more it's kind of hard to miss yeah and so so let me play the other side of the coin there okay. so what, what i was just talking about there playing devil's advocate uh for my some of my buddies on twitter is that uh that yes when janet yellen spends money and that the debt let's say is monetized by the fed by them uh buying okay. uh, those treasuries through bank reserves uh but prior to that when the treasuries were purchased initially they were purchased with cash or uh liabilities of the commercial banking system to to your point the primary dealers don't have uh accounts with the fed okay. therefore they can't use those bank reserves to uh to buy the treasuries and therefore uh, okay, you take the this? dollars so, out of the system before you put the dollars back in the system i think i understand your question so let's say i have a hundred dollars right and the treasury issues a hundred dollars in treasury debt i buy that hundred dollars right right so, you now i have a treasury and then the primary deal takes a hundred dollars uh, it takes uh, and then sells it let's say the treasury issues a hundred dollars and i buy that and then i sell that to the fed right right so i get my hundred dollars back i'm equal right and the fed's balance sheet has that hundred dollars but you know you also have to see that the treasury had a hundred more dollars in their treasury tga account which they didn't spend inside spend back into the system so i have my hundred dollars the treasury has that hundred dollars that they spent back so the banking system gets a hundred dollars bigger and the treasury and the fed has that one hundred dollars uh on their assets yeah, right. So, but that's if, okay, so if I'm understanding this correctly, uh, the, the dealers are, are the ones that are buying the treasuries from uh, Janet Yellen. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And they do not have reserve accounts. So most of them don't. So most of them are separate, not, they're not banks. So 
So they're, they're non-bank not entities. They're not banks, yeah. Okay. Uh, most of them are not. Some some of the foreign primary dealers are banks and they have a reserve account. But in practice, it doesn't really matter. It's it's kind of like back office stuff, the plumbing that that, that it's it doesn't really matter. Okay. And then when the Fed is doing QE, uh, they're buying those treasuries that were potentially just purchased uh, yesterday uh, mm-hmm. from the well, the dealers themselves. Yes. So the. So they okay, got it. So then they'd be replacing. So then the dealers would have an account with a bank that did have bank reserves. Uh-huh. So then the, the the okay, yeah. So I'm getting it now because then that would uh, increase the uh, liabilities of the commercial banking system by the exact same amount as it was decreased when the treasuries were purchased originally. Therefore, when Janet Yellen spends it back, yeah, it, then it's increasing the, yeah. the net amount of dollars. Yeah, the way I was thinking about it is if a, if an actual bank that had a reserve account did uh, bought the treasuries in the first place uh, with bank reserves, then the Fed would just replace those bank reserves. No big deal. But yeah. if a bank bought the uh, a banking entity bought the treasuries in the first place by using a different form of cash or dollars on their balance sheet that was actually a liability of the commercial banking system, then effectively what would happen at the end of the transaction is you would be decreasing the amount of quote unquote cash on that bank's balance sheet and increasing the amount of reserves they have after the Fed bought the treasury from them that they just bought the day prior from Janet Yellen. And so and so technically, 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 uh, you did have a decrease in dollars in the private sector, although it, I would argue it would have been a decrease in dollars that just really circulated in the financial system and, and, and doesn't really count. And I, I think so, we can really get into the weeds and the plumbing, but correct me if I'm wrong, at the end of the day, when people are trying to figure out inflation and deflation, they, they've got to get hyper-focused on the amount of dollars on the balance sheet of non-bank entities, because at the end of the day, those are most likely the dollars that are chasing goods and services. So, you know, I agree completely. And one of the, one, one of, I've done this in, in a previous blog post, and it's just to look at doing that breakdown between where the money goes to, right? Does the money go to people who have less than 250,000 in their accounts? Or does the money go to people who have more than 250,000 in their accounts? Because mm-hmm. then when it goes to the big corporations and the rich people and so forth, it's spent on financial assets, right? And when it goes to people who are, let's say, lower income, then it's spent on goods and services. Right. One of the interesting things that you can that you can see, and this is on my blog, is that the prior episodes of QE, let's say, um, you know, uh, at post financial crisis, almost all the money went to people that had more than 250,000 in their accounts. So, Almost all of it went into like the corporate accounts or the institutional investor accounts and so forth. And so I think it's no surprise that you saw a lot of the new bank deposits basically go and chase financial assets or housing and things like that. But what's completely different this time is that there's so much money. Uh, well, first of all, a lot of the money still went the, to the big accounts, but 1.3 trillion went into smaller accounts as well. And you see just enormous increases in commodity prices or let's say uh, all trade prices. Uh, housing for example right yeah so and you we were buying a lot of stuff from uh, from china and so forth the trade deficit so you kind of see a uh, real the real economy responding to that because uh small accounts or lower income people have a lot more money this time around and i think that's a huge difference and it's just as you say it's where the money goes non-banks and uh, which non-banks yeah, that's a great point. I, I, I think I need to even get more nuanced in my thinking and, and not just separate the because uh, I was separating the financial economy with the real economy. And then I started f- separating the non banks with the actual banks. But I've got to take it a step further and subdivide the non banks into accounts of over 250 and under 250. So you're getting a better idea of of the amount of dollars that are actually have the potential to circulate in the real economy with a significant amount of velocity. And then you overlay the supply side or the supply disruptions. If we're going to have more supply, if we're going to have less supply due to taxes, government regulation, et cetera. And then you can start figuring out, okay, what is the CPI 
most likely or the real CPI, <laughs> you know, not, not the cut <laughs> numbers that we get from the government, but, but what's the real, the price of the stuff that normal people buy daily? W- what is the probability that those increase um, over the next year, you know, two years, five years, uh, et cetera? That, that, that's really helpful for me. No, I agree. That's how I look at it. it I, you know, I, I think it, it's highly inflationary what's happening now. And, but I guess we'll see. I mean, we have a lot of people on, on the other side of that, but I guess we'll find out. I'd like to get your take on um, if you think the Fed can ever reverse course. I mean, there we talk about QE, 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 but do you think we'll ever get to a point where the Fed can actually reduce their balance sheet? Or maybe a better question would be, do you think we'll get to a point where the Fed won't have to con- uh, increase their balance sheet at an exponential rate? Exponential. Uh, I think it really depends on what the Treasury is doing, right? So one of the things that the Fed does is that it kind of takes away interest rate risk from the market. So you have all these Treasuries outstanding, right? The thing about Treasuries, especially if you have like a 10-year or a 30-year, their value fluctuates with the market, sometimes significantly. And you have all these, you're telling everyone that shows your safe assets, you got to hold them. The bank's got to hold them. The pension fund's got to hold them. Retirement funds got to hold them. And so that's fine as long as the treasury values don't fluctuate a lot, right? But if you start having a big, uh, let's say, an inflationary boom where people are selling treasuries, then that's a lot of uh, market value that disappears. You know, it's it, it'll crash the treasury market. And I think that's really... Uh, difficult socially to accept because so many people hold treasuries as safe assets. And so I think the Fed will kind of have to keep that in mind if they ever want to shrink the balance sheet. Um, because when right. you shrink the balance sheet, you, you know, you basically making treasury prices go lower and treasuries are a foundation of the financial system. Uh, in a sense, like you mentioned, they're, they're collateral for, for, for a lot of things. And when you either raise rates or shrink the balance sheet, then you're kind of making that collateral value shrink and you're taking money out of the financial system and that could be very destabilizing. I, I, I don't think the Fed can realistically shrink their balance sheet. Uh, maybe if the Treasury starts, stops borrowing so much, maybe, but on, on, we're not really on that trajectory. Yeah, and see, if I think if the Treasury stops borrowing as much, i.e. the government stops spending as much, then that will collapse or could potentially collapse the real economy. Because, you know, in my mind, it, you know, everyone looks around and says, oh, the economy is booming, the economy is booming. And I say, well, maybe, but the government just ran a $5 trillion deficit. So what happens to the economy if the deficit would have been zero? You know, if, if the government would have spent uh, $4 trillion instead of $9 trillion or $10 trillion or whatever they spent, which is a, a huge, huge, huge percentage of overall GDP. I mean, we would be in a massive depression. I mean, something that would be very similar, if not worse, than what we saw in the 1930s. And therefore, you know, how does the government reel that back in? Uh, I, I don't think they can. I think they have to continue to not only deficit spend, but increase the size of their deficit spending, which I guess takes us to the dollar. Uh, if the Fed's got to keep interest rates low and the government has to continue to deficit spend to a greater and greater degree, which, which oh, by the way, is most likely going to increase the trade deficit, the twin deficits I actually talked about in today's video, is the, re- is the release valve inevitably the dollar? So you're, what, the Fed is, what the Fed and the Treasury are doing are inflationary, and that should be dollar negative, as, as you say. But the strange thing is that the dollar's value hasn't really changed all that much in the past year, right? I mean, we had a right. big drop uh, last year, and then we kind of stayed around, and now it's been strengthening recently. So I think it's, it's hard to make that prediction. Of course, the dollar trades relative to other currencies, and uh, other countries are also doing large deficits, and they're also doing QE, right? But what really, I think for a fiat currency system, what really holds it together is just confidence in the government. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the U.S. has been a superpower for, for most, uh, for everyone alive, right? So for, for the past, since it's World War II. So people have a lot of confidence in the U.S. and they think that the U.S. is a well-managed country. And 
until they see things differently, I think they will still be happy to hold dollars. But I think it's really confidence that holds it together, not so much as to how much the Treasury is spending and what the Fed is doing, although those two things can hurt confidence in the system. Yeah, absolutely. Whenever I think of inflation or the, or the dollar, I always try to get as nuanced there as I can as well. And so I, I, I try to look at the Dixie, but I also try to say, OK, it, it's not just the dollar against other fiat currencies, but the, it's it's the dollar against asset prices or it's the dollar against uh, domestic goods and services. Because you can have the I mean, if you look at a chart of the Dixie and the chart of the CPI, there's no correlation to it whatsoever. Uh, you know, same thing with asset prices. So it's it's at the end of the day, it's a very complex puzzle, but it, it sure doesn't get old, does it? No, no, I mean, <laughs> never a dull moment. <laughs> looking at asset prices, the dollar has naturally depreciated, right? Everything, all asset prices are rising rapidly. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, hey, uh, I've kept you a long time. I sure appreciate the conversation. This was incredibly insightful, and I, I just, man, I, I cannot wait to to do this again and and pick your brain. I'm I'm sure glad you were you're willing to come on. Thank you very much again for your time. For uh, my viewers who want to find out more about what you do or follow you on social media, go to your website, go to the blog. Where, think, where can they go to check that out? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter, FedGuyWantTo, and I also have a website, FedGuy.com. And if you're really interested in the basics of central banking, you can check out my book on Amazon, Central Banking 101. And thanks so much for having me on, George. I really enjoyed all your videos, and I'm excited to be here. We've got to we've got to do this periodically, like once every Absolutely. couple of months. We we got to get you on to talk about reverse repo and all this craziness with the with the dollar monetary system for sure. For sure, anytime. All right, have a good one. Thanks, George. Hi guys, I'd like to invite each and every one of you to the next Rebel Capitalist Live event. If you are a fan of the Rebel Capitalist show. I guarantee you, you will love the live event. The next one is Houston, where you can meet and listen to speakers, all your favorites from the Rebel Capitalist Show. People such as Dr. Ron Paul, Chris Cole, Lynn Alden, Luke Groman, just to name a few. If you want to check out the rest of the speaker list and find out how you can attend, we'll put a link in in the description below, or you can just go to rebelcapitalistlive.com. This is an event where you can learn to build wealth and thrive in a world of out-of-control central banks and big governments. But it's not just about building wealth. It's about increasing your freedom and networking with like-minded individuals, fellow rebel capitalists. It's an amazing event. I know you'll absolutely love it. Check out rebelcapitalistlive.com and I will see you in Houston.